Becoming Human, a Social Task, The Threefold Social Order, by Carl Koenig. Edited by Richard Steele. Translated from the German by Carlotta Dyson. Michaelmas and the Threefold Social Order, The Spiritual History of Central Europe and the Threefold Structure of the Karlstein Castle, a first of three lectures given by Karl Koenig at Buell on Sunday, September 20th, 1964. Before this reading is begun, I would like to help you draw a diagram, a ground plan, of the Karlstein Castle, which appears in the publication. This plan is referred to at the end of the lecture and you will have a better idea of what Karl Koenig is talking about it if you now take a pencil and paper and sketch a very rough diagram of the layout of this castle. First, draw a big boot, a Wellington boot, a rain boot, a snow boot, with the toe pointing out on the left. Side view of the boot with the toe on the left. Ex draw a little extension from the toe as if there was a short ski under the boot. So you have a boot with the toe on the left and a short extension going out further to the left from the boot. Now at the top of the boot, the top of the boot on the left side, write a letter D. This is the first gate into the castle grounds. Then follow the space going from the top of the boot down to the juncture where the, where the beginning of the toes would be and the boot would start jutting out to the left. So travel down from D to this juncture and write a letter E. This is the second gate into the castle grounds. You go through that gate and now you are in the toe of the boot. There is here a large courtyard. Continue to walk through the courtyard and go out on the extension which I called the ski and put a letter F. That is the well house for the people in the castle. Now come on back along the bottom of the boot or the sole of the boot. Come back to that space with the letter G and there is a building called the Burgrave's Palace. The Burgrave is a lesser, a lesser degree of royalty, not the emperor himself. He lives in the Burgrave's Palace. Continue along the sole of the boot towards going towards the heel and put a letter A. This is the imperial palace where the emperor and his family live. Now move upward, upward uh, going up the boot but being to the right of the left, being to the right of the way we came down and put a letter B. This is the Lady Chapel, and we'll talk more about that in the lecture. And then continue again more to the right than to the left. Continue up the boot and put a letter C. This is the very important Holy Cross Chapel, which includes a high tower, the most prominent feature of the castle when you look at it from a distance. Now, if you have this rough sketch of the castle, we are ready to begin reading the lecture. The Spiritual History of Central Europe and the Threefold Structure of the Karlstein Castle. Dear friends, on our recent trip to Bohemia, it was really the visit to the Karlstein Castle that made the deepest impression on us. As I have been studying both the building itself and the history of this castle for a long time, 
in fact, over 30 years. I thought that I might say something about its history as well as its significance and position within the spiritual life of Europe. Rudolf Steiner also referred to it now and then in private conversation. He said, for example, that Charles IV, the builder of the Karlstein Castle, had been the last initiate on the imperial throne. During a visit to the Karlstein, as far as I can remember it, was in 1920, in the company of Count and Countess Pulzer Hodes, ascending the staircase into the chapel of the Holy Cross with them, he pointed out that the wall paintings along the staircase, ostensibly depicting scenes from the life of St. Winselas and his grandmother, St. Ludmilla, were actually scenes illustrating the chemical wedding. Evidence of the fact that this last initiate on the imperial throne had still been able to give shape and form to this castle on the basis of spiritual insight. Now, many people who visit this castle, upon entering one chapel or another, one room or another, or passing through this or that particular door, may find themselves inspired by a sudden spiritual insight, while others, perhaps hundreds of thousands, walk through it and it means nothing to them. And so this building has stood for 700 years, might say, at the very heart of Europe, and it still appears as chaste and untouched as ever. It is almost impossible to grasp that the stern clarity of its structure, the austere beauty of its form, has been preserved in its original state. There was also the impression we received this time, despite the terrific crowds, that this was still the case. The guide told us that every year now, hordes of people, Almost a quarter of a million, in fact, are herded through, and yet none of the spiritual magic of this castle has been lost. From whatever side one approaches the castle, which is situated to the west of Prague, one initially follows the Barone Valley and then ascends, finally reaching a landscape of hills and woods, and suddenly, the castle appears, the central tower and other surrounding buildings, high up on a limestone outcrop, inaccessible from the north, west, and east, a magical structure. One asks oneself, what makes it so magical? It is bare, square, and nevertheless quite extraordinary. It is important to look at the historical background of the creation of this architectural structure. The Karlstein was built in, 19, uh, in 1348. The Karlstein was built in 1348, more or less exactly in the middle of the 14th century. And what does this 14th century represent? The Karlstein forms part of a tremendous building drive, which emanated essentially from the personality of Charles IV. At the same time as the castle, a particular part of Prague, the so-called lesser town, Malastrana, was built. Charles IV saw to it that the powerful artistic personality of Peter Parler was given the opportunity of building the St. Vitus Cathedral. Prague Castle was enormously extended. The Charles Bridge across the Moldu, the Vlad, the Vladova, the Vlad, the <laughs> was built in the heart of Prague. All these buildings still exist today. If you walk across the Charles Bridge, so massive, wide, and powerful, you will find it hard to imagine how much a structure of so 
of so much formative strength could have been built 700 years ago. And as you walk across the bridge, the castle and the St. Vitus Cathedral gradually come into view in front of you. However, this development was not confined to Prague. St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna, for example, was built at the same time, as well as the Freiburg Minster and the Cologne Cathedral. All these buildings arose from the Gothic style, and yet they were no longer typically Gothic, leading already beyond the peak of this style, from its flowering into the middle, in the Middle Ages into the extraordinary 14th century, when old forms were disintegrating while new ones were being prepared but could not yet reach perfection. It was also at this time, in 1348, that the first German university was founded by the same Charles IV in Prague. Soon after, in 1365, the University of Vienna was founded, and very quickly, only a few years later, the University of Krakow. You can see that in the 14th century, the center of gravity of the sciences, of theology, of medicine, was shifting from the west and the south of Europe to the east. In the 13th century, the University of Paris had still been the center of all knowledge and scholarship, the place where Thomas Aquinas, Albertus Magnus, and all the other prominent scholars taught. A short time before that, Chartres, to the south of Paris, had been a center of medieval spiritual life. Italy, too, had had universities, but now suddenly the East was beginning to wake up. At the same time, the Order of Teutonic Knights was spreading eastward, towards the Baltic regions, towards Poland, towards East Prussia. Here you see as one of the characteristics of the 14th century, the fact that Central Europe was no longer confined to the Rhine, which until then had been the scene of all important developments. Now Bohemia, Hungary, Poland, and the Baltic regions began to wake up. After he had become Holy Roman Emperor in 1346, Charles IV had been the first to move the center of the Reich to the east of Europe. Prague became the capital of Europe for the first time. And around this center, things began to unfold. At the same time, the first precursors of what would later become known as humanism and the Reformation developed in several places. The period between the end of the 13th and the beginning of the 14th centuries saw a towering figure such as Dante. And we can hardly mention Dante without remembering his contemporary, Giotto. What emerged here simultaneously represented the conclusion of the Middle Ages and the emergence of the modern age of that epoch. For immediately following Dante came Petrarch and Poccaccio, these two great Italian poets, writers, who were in fact already beginning to develop and express their thoughts and feelings in a kind of modern spirit. Reading the Decameron or some of Petrarch's writings where, the first, where for the first time an attempt is made to transform Greco-Roman cultural elements into European-Italian ones. It is noticeable that the all-encompassing thought cosmos of someone like Dante, which still had the quality of a macrocosm, had come to an end. Mankind was beginning to acquire new faculties. <laughs>
Now we know from Rudolf Steiner that around the middle of the 13th century, in approximately 1250, a mighty incision took place in the spiritual life of mankind. This incision marked the end of the possibility of immediate and direct spiritual knowledge. In the middle of the 12th century, the walls between the physical and spiritual world became impermeable, as it were, and personalities such as Thomas Aquinas or Albertus Magnus were no longer able to gain even the slightest insight into the spiritual world. What they did was to create a worldview by their own efforts of thinking. But imagination or inspiration was no longer accessible. The sunset, the sunset of a final direct perception of the spiritual world is represented by Dante in Magnificent Beauty. The last remnants of direct, immediate, medieval spirituality now come to an end. Human beings woke up into a kind of self-knowledge and lost the vast, the last vestiges of spiritual perception, which had previously lived in them as an intimation of spirit vision. When a process such as this takes place, we usually find that a certain seal is impressed upon it. In the middle of the 14th century, a terrible seal of this end of the Middle Ages was impressed upon European humanity. That seal was the plague, which at that time was called the Black Plague. I believe that today we cannot even begin to imagine to what extent this plague ravaged the population. Starting in Constantinople in 1347, it spread via Messina and Venice through the whole of Italy, swept through Switzerland and southern Germany into France, into northern Germany, Bohemia, and up to the Baltic countries, to Britain and Ireland, right up to Iceland and to Greenland. In Central Europe, many millions of people perished in just a few years. It is estimated that about a quarter of all Europeans, whole generations, fathers, children, mothers, particularly in the towns, but also in the villages, were exterminated by this plague. Outbreaks reoccurred in the 15th, 16th, and 17th century, but did not take hold of the population to anything like the extent it had done in the 14th century. It is interesting to characterize this disease, at least tentatively. It is an epidemic transmitted by rats and fleas. We should contemplate this fact a little. The fleas get the plague bacillus from the rats and transmit it to humans. This means that the lowest form of human existence, the most devilish form of human existence, becomes the carrier of this epidemic. The fleas transmit it to humans. Wherever the fleas bite, boils develop, which ulcerate. However, the center of the plague attack is the lung, the organ that, according to Rudolf Steiner, represents the earthly solid element in us, and it is precisely this organ that is destroyed. So during the very time when people became bearers of sense-based earthly thoughts, millions were exterminated by this merciless disease, which had its origins in Tibet. We should really explore this in detail someday.
At the very time when the emerging humanism of the 15th and 16th century were foreshadowed in the work of Petrarch and Boccaccio, there were also precursors of the Reformation. From a historical point of view, something very interesting now emerged. The close relationship between England and Bohemia. The spiritual relationship between England and Bohemia became visible. The Reformation really began with John Wycliffe. Wycliffe was born in Yorkshire in the 1320s, and sometime later he became professor of divinity at Oxford University. Oxford was already a famous university at a time when in Prague the university was just beginning. And Wycliffe was one of the first to harbor doubts about church Christianity, which had become pompous and rigid. He had doubts as well about the priesthood and the supremacy of the Pope. He turned against celibacy and expressed doubts about the transubstantiation in the sacrament of communion. He said, and this was one of his main teachings, that the Church should not really be a visible institution at all, but that the Church was for him nothing but, quote, the invisible community of those who are predestined for beatitude or the blessed life." Unquote. It is so important to see how a new living spirit, a new way of thinking in the direction of community, emerges in that century. The existing institutions are typical for the end of the Middle Ages being outwardly fixed by rules, vestments, and statutes. Now a man appears, and it is significant that he should be an Englishman, who asserts that the true church is not the visible one, but the invisible community of those pre predestined for beatitude, for the blessed life. At the same time, his awakening thought life makes him doubt transubstantiation. What possible basis could he have had for comprehending and affirming it? Now John Wycliffe had a follower called Jerome, who was born around 1365 or maybe 1379 and later, having become a teacher of divinity and became known as Jerome of Prague. He studied Wycliffe's ideas at Oxford and took his teachings over to Bohemia. There is a connection here. He was a friend of the great reformer Jan Hus. Together these three, Wycliffe, Jerome of Prague, and Jan Hus, constitute the actual protagonists of the 14th century pre-Reformation. We should not forget that Huss and Jerome were burnt at the stake just across from us in Ferenbrühl in Constance. Huss in 1415 and Jerome in 1416. This was at the same time of the Council of Constance, which took place between 1414 and 1417. The fact that these two men, who aside from Charles IV, can be regarded as the leaders of the Czech Bohemian Awakening, were burnt in this area, the area of Fernbuhl, by the Catholic Church, is a significant part of the 14th century. This was not the only significant development Apart from what we can see as an influence on building, on religious life, on literary, literary and artistic life, below the surface of outer spiritual life, a new stream emerges. This new stream emanates exclusively from the Dominican order, 
This stream first arose in the 13th century, coming to a flowering in the 14th century, and that represents the flowering of German mysticism. It began with Meister Eckhart, who sat at the feet of Thomas Aquinas and Albertus Magnus. He had absorbed a new kind of Platonism, and with direct spiritual perception no longer being possible, he had been able to kindle within himself the spark of divine light through inner schooling, through spiritual schooling. He calls this light his tiny spark, the eternal light that every human soul can kindle within. He had pupils who were also Dominicans. One of them was Heinrich Soiza, or Souza, who lived between 1295 and 1366, either here in Überlingen or in Constance. It is not known exactly which. He was an extraordinarily lovable personality, unbelievable in the degree of his spiritual cognition, but at the same time extremely clear and incisive. He wrote the first German autobiography. If you would like to get a feeling for the spirit of this region, I would recommend you read this autobiography or even the autobiography of Charles IV. Then there was the greatest of the three, Johannes Tauler, 1330 to 1361, whose formidable activity was based in Alsace, Alsace and in Strasbourg and in Basel. These three Dominicans, who worked through sermons streaming from their innermost soul, represented a further source of the developments that took place in the 14th century. It is well known that particularly through Toller, mysticism was linked to the subterranean stream in history connected with the activity of the friend of God. The friend of God is that exalted personality who was none other than the great Zarathustra. He would appear again and again throughout history as a leader of humanity. Through the cooperation between the friend of God and Toller, Toller the mighty preacher, something of what was working secretly in the background, in the heart of history during that time, became visible to those who had eyes to see. Up to the 12th and 13th century, perhaps until 2020, oh, sorry, 1220 or 1230, it was still possible for earnestly seeking pupils to find their spiritual teacher. Rudolf Steiner once described in a heart-moving way how such meetings would take place, how the eye of the teacher could perceive the pupil leading to immediate spiritual cognition. We learn further how the pupil was then led to an experience of the spirit of his youth, the spirit of his old age, and how he thereby discovered through direct experience that the other world is real while this world is unreal. This possibility came to an end around the turn of the 12th to the 13th centuries, ceasing completely. The time in which people were still able to have direct spiritual meetings had passed. From then on, individual spiritual striving personalities would gather together, praying, meditating, seeking one another in community, resulting in an extraordinarily intimate mood taking hold of such small circles of people in which supersensible beings would appear to them, not physically, who would say to them, through your humility, through your humility, 
humility. Through your prayer, through your devotion, you have called me. Dear friends, this is how from the end of the 13th century right through the 14th century, those beginnings were made which were the seeds of what later became Rosicrucianism. Here I would like to quote a passage from a lecture by Rudolf Steiner. Quote, now something else developed within this endeavor of spiritual research, of spiritual cognition. It is something extremely beautiful to behold when one sees. Here are three brothers and four others. Three brothers who are only able to succeed in making a meaningful contribution to the world if the other four work together with them. They are completely dependent on each other. The three are able to receive revelations from the spiritual world, while the other four are able to translate them into ordinary human language. What the three are able to give would remain completely unintelligible pictures if the other four were not able to translate them. And on the other hand, the four would have nothing to translate if the three did not receive the revelations from the spiritual world in the form of pictures. As a result of this, something developed within such communities, which particularly in those centuries was regarded by certain circles to be among the very highest human achievements, namely, an inner brotherhood of soul, a brotherhood of cognition, a brotherhood of spiritual life. Through their striving in this regard, such small circles came to experience the real value of brotherhood. Gradually, they began to feel more and more strongly that in the course of humanity's development towards freedom, the bond between human beings and the gods would be completely severed unless it were maintained through this kind of brotherhood where one person is truly dependent on the other. End of quote. Now in these small brotherhoods, three would sometimes go out as it were, and in so doing, would receive spiritual revelations in the form of images, bringing these inner pictures back with them. The other four would translate these pictures into signs, into the language of the time, and were thus able to communicate and utilize them. And we must imagine one group and another, and a third and a fourth and a fifth group, often knowing nothing of each other, some perhaps living in a town, others moving from village to village, healing the sick and preparing for what would later in the 15th and 16th centuries come together in the secret order of the Rosicrucians. These were the three and the four. All these phenomena, dear friends, were part of an understanding of the inner nature of the 14th century. But what was happening outwardly? I shall just highlight a few developments. Switzerland became a confederation in 1381. The state of the Teutonic Order developed in the East, as I mentioned earlier. At the close of the Middle Ages, the important ruling dynasties and their outer influence also came to an end. Henceforth, there would be no more Atonian or Saxon, Salian or Frankish, or Hohenstaufen emperors. All this had come to an end. Only one or the other of these diverse lineages would ascend the throne. Charles IV was from Luxembourg, 
His predecessors had been a Bavarian, an Austrian, a member of the Habsburg family. The succession was no longer predetermined. Charles IV was a great organizer and builder. He now instituted something that, in my opinion, has been completely understood, or rather, completely misunderstood. He created a completely pragmatic law that has entered the annals of history as the Golden Bull. This is a law regulating the election of the Holy Roman Emperor. The remarkable thing about it is that it stipulated that seven so-called electors have the right to appoint the emperor. This means that there was no longer a hereditary succession based on the bloodline. But the seven have the task, as it were, to choose the most suitable person. In reality, they did not do this in most cases, but at least that was the intention. And who were these seven? The seven were three spiritual leaders and four secular rulers. In this, Charles IV acted out of an awareness of the small inspired circles active in the background of historical developments. And this is what he wanted to bring to the fore here. The three spiritual leaders were to receive the inspirations while the four secular ones were to translate them and turn them into practical action. The three were the archbishops of Mainz, Trier, and Cologne. The four were the rulers of Saxony, Brandenburg, the Palatinate, and Bohemia. Now it may seem strange, but it was one of the remarkable insights of Charles IV that there were three archbishops to represent the world of the three dioceses. Cologne stood for Italy, Mainz for Germany, and Trier for Burgundy, and four secular lords. These were the Lord Cupbearer, the Lord High Steward, the Lord Marshal, and the Lord Chamberlain. Now, of course, did not, this did not mean that they served wine and food to the emperor and kept his rooms tidy but it meant that they represented the power of the wine and the power of the bread, the altar, and the vestment. This means that the spiritual realm and the earthly realm were intertwined in this golden bull. At the core of all this is the wellspring of the Rosicrucian impulse, which I have already mentioned. All of this underlies the building of the Karlstein Castle. That is the actual spiritual foundation of this building. Historians and anybody else who tries to explain the Karlstein or who writes about it would say that the reason it was built so solidly was to safeguard the crown insignia and important state documents behind strong walls. Of course, outwardly, this is quite right, and yet at the same time, it is wrong. Charles IV was in fact an initiate on the imperial throne. And while his endeavors were premature, he saw the role of the emperor as the representative of the spirit on earth. His insignia were kept in the sacred Christian space State documents were drawn up and signed in this same sacred space. This was the intention and purpose for which the Karlstein was built. Perhaps I can now give you a brief description by way of an overview of the castle itself. Approaching the Karlstein, one sees various structures. The very highest is the square tower, C in the diagram, 
This tower is connected only through a small wooden bridge with another building, B. Somewhat larger, situated a bit lower down, and also isolated. This building in turn is connected through a corridor and a gallery to a much larger building, A. These are the three main buildings. The entrance is through the first gate, D, and there is a second gate, E, before one comes to a large courtyard. The whole thing has a strange layout, resembling a kind of snail shell, which has in its highest point, which has as its highest point, the tallest central structure. The building adjoining the courtyard at G was the apartments or palace of the Burgrave of the castle. It has nothing to do with the castle itself. In front of the Imperial Palace, A, there is another courtyard with a spring that still runs today, enclosed in a brick channel deep underground. The whole structure is built on rock. Everywhere you see rocks showing through. The large building, A, is the Imperial Palace, containing both the private apartments and the small St. Nicholas Chapel at its lower right for the use of the Imperial family and its entourage. Walking a little further, you come to the part which consists of two sections. One of these is the Lady Chapel, B, which was originally decorated with wonderful representations of the whole apocalypse. Unfortunately, only traces of it can be seen today. And this little side chapel here, adjoining the Lady Chapel, was built for Charles IV. He would go there every Maundy Thursday, staying there until Easter Sunday in prayer and meditation. There was only a small hatch through which important state documents could be passed for signature, as well as drink and a little food. During this time, he would not see any other human being face to face. From there, you go up to the tower. In this tower, there was a long flight of steps leading to the highest chapel, Chapel of the Holy Cross, at letter C. The left side of the stairway on the way up shows scenes from the life of St. Wenceslas, showing sowing the corn, harvesting the wheat, threshing of the wheat, and the baking of the bread. And on the other side, the life of St. Ludmilla, where she is picking grapes, pressing them, making them into wine. At the top of the stairway, you come to the door of the chapel, and above the door you see St. Wenceslas and St. Ludmilla partaking of the chemical meal. And then the door opens, and you find yourself standing in a large space, dividing into two by a trellis, the larger space in front and the smaller one behind the trellis. The walls are clad in malachite and inlaid everywhere with magnificent precious stones. Carnelian, topaz, beryl, and so forth. Above, the walls are covered with portraits of saints painted by the great painter of the time, Theodoric of Prague. There are about 90 saints altogether. The fact that behind each of the saints, a relic connected with the saint was let into the wall has largely been forgotten today. In the smaller space, there is an altar. And above the altar, this is the chapel of the Holy Cross. Relics from Golgotha were set into the wall. So you can actually feel yourself <coughs> surrounded 
And if you want to, you can still experience this today. You are surrounded by the sacrifice and sufferings of so many important saints. Something quite extraordinary seems to be living and weaving in this space. Along the wall there were chests in which the documents relating to the golden bull were kept, while behind the altar the imperial insignia were kept locked away. So the imperial palace, letter A, is the building pertaining to the life of the body. Then on entering the Lady Chapel, letter B, people could more and more experience the life of the soul. Ascending to the highest, to the Holy Cross, at letter C, ascending to the Holy Spirit, something was enkindled which was the fire of the Holy Spirit. This is one aspect of the Karlstein. Next time, we shall look at the castle in connection with the threefold social order. In conclusion, I would like to point out something particular. This 14th century, which we have endeavored to understand, is actually framed by two events of great importance for mankind. One of them occurs in 1314, and the other in 1413. In 1314, the last Knights Templar were burned at the stake together with their last Grand Master, Jacques de Molay, at the instigation of one of the most evil spirits in history, Philip the Fair of France. Through this event, the Middle Ages were extinguished by means of fire and the sword. Then something new began to stir. The early precursors of the Reformation, of humanism, the early beginnings of Rosicrucianism and of mysticism, leading to the year 1413, when a new age dawns. When the age of the consciousness soul begins, in which we are still living today, the 14th century, framed by these two events, is the age of Charles IV, who was born in 1316 and died in 1378. In the same year, in 1378, Christian Rosenkreutz was born again and began his journeys to Holland, where he became a monk. He traveled from there to Damascus, Arabia, Egypt, absorbing the last remnants of Eastern spirituality. And returning in 1459, he founded the Rosicrucian Order. In this order are gathered together the many small springs of the Brotherhoods of Seven, that I described earlier. At that time, the Reformation as well as humanism were unleashed. It was also the time when the printing press was invented, a completely new epoch began to gain momentum. Something momentous was happening here. Yet the inner spirit of continuity was preserved. Whether this would be sustainable in the long run, no one could say at that time. The matter was settled in the 14th century. The person who helped on the one hand to externalize it yet preserving its inner essence, was Charles IV, and the Karlstein Castle bears witness to this. It is still possible to experience this today if we approach the building with an open heart. One can still sense the spirit of Rosicrucianism hovering over it. Walking through these gates, one can sometimes have the feeling Christian Rosenkreutz himself passed through here.